Hey everyone, I am Charting Man Dan with the Chart Guys, joined with Chart Guys Lamont, also of the Chart Guys. In this video, we're going to be talking about our different styles. We essentially speak two different languages to describe the same thing, and we have very different trading styles, but uh, they are similar in some ways and different in some ways. So we're going to talk about how volume profile and how Lamont uses volume profile is similar to my style and different than my style. And, and many of you know my style from the daily videos, higher lows and higher highs, trends, and uh, the different multiple time frame analysis and how they all relate to each other. And to go along with this webinar, we are going to have a sale on our swing report. And the swing report is headed up by Lamont and he uses volume profile to select these picks. And he has been doing a fantastic job over the last year, two years uh, of, of picking some nice plays. And, and one of the things that I have uh, learned is he's better than me at picking levels in advance through volume profile. And, you know, I, I like to react to different trend changes and things as they happen because I'm so used to being at the screen. But obviously with swing trading, one of the things we want to do is be away from the screen. And so that's where he utilizes his skill set for the swing report. So we're going to do a, a half off sale starting now and running through the next week plus uh, for 50% off uh, one month. And again, our goal, as always, with any of our services is we want you to make the money to pay for the service through the service. Meaning, you know, if Mont Lamont keeps these good picks up, no pressure, Lamont, if he keeps these good picks going, then ideally you make enough money from this swing report to keep paying for it and, and have it be useful. So welcome, Lamont. Hey, thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's honestly, it's hard for me to accept what you're saying about picking the levels. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't really think I'm better. <laughs> I just think it's different, like you said. Um, but yeah, I appreciate that. So let's start, shall... let's start off real quick, simple. What is volume profile? Okay. So volume profile is simply looking at the volume distribution of the price action data that you see on the chart. So for example, this is the volume profile on the side right now. This is the visible range volume profile, meaning it's showing you all the visible range. So all of this stuff, all of these candles here, it's plotting the volume distribution of that. So how much volume was traded at that price. So you know that there's a lot more volume traded at 51 than there is at 56. And share, so you can share your screen how... real quick. Share your screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on a second here. Um, can you see that? Yeah, we're good. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so volume profile is going to let you know, it's going to plot the volume, the volume distribution of whatever is on the chart right here. That's called the visible range volume profile. So if I scroll in, this guy is going to change on the side over here. Let's give it a second, and it's going to change, right? So if I zoom out and I, I see all this price action data, it's going to it's going to plot the volume profile for all of this visible range. So for example, then you can see how there's a lot more volume traded at like 51 and a quarter and 55 or so. And you can see how there's very little volume traded here or less volume traded here. And you can see how price has a much easier time going through this area. It's, it's no different than, um, what is uh, what is that fella's name? Reminiscence of a stock operator, Jesse Livermore, right? The idea is that the, the market will travel the swiftest through areas of low resistance. What, what are areas of low resistance? Areas where there's low volume. Because if there was high volume there in the past, then you should have old business waiting to do business there, meaning stop losses, right? You should have stop losses, a lot of orders. If there's a lot of trading done here, you, you can bet your booty there's a bunch of stop losses as well that is in here. You know what I mean? So these blocks of volume, they have to be worked through in order for the market to advance, no different than any other market, right? And that's just how it has to go, right? If there is demand, that if there's net demand, right, excess demand, prices have to go up. If there's excess supply, prices have to go down, right? So volume profile lets you see where all the supply and demand blocks are. So just let's cut it right there. So with that information, just some similarities and some differences with my style, uh, I can see similarities where I look at price action being within a range. And let's just look at the same chart you have up right now, ARM, from end of November into start of December, we're building a base of support. And so it's almost like I know that there's a lot of volume there. I know that we're building support and that a lot of shares are traded in a tight range. And that also tells me, look for the tight range to break in the near term because we know volatility is coming. So essentially it's, you know, my, my style is, you know, we've got the supply and demand scales and they're balancing out. And we know that that tight range is going to see those scales tilt 
in, in one direction or the other. So let's just go to this ARM example again, end of November, early December, building that base in the low 60s. Uh, what would lead you to believe that there is a higher probability that we're going to break bull versus that we're going to break bear? Okay, so that part is actually quite straightforward, right? Because if you just look at this prior high, right? This is the absolute high of all of this demand, right? This had to have been demand because prices came out of it, right? They, they broke out of it, prices marked up. So this has to be net demand here. So after you break out from 56.79, if these sellers during this retracement cannot come back down to where they broke out of, well, what does that tell you about the sellers? You know, are they strong or are they weak? Right? They, they must be weak if these sellers can't get back to where they just broke out of. Their objective after this move is to come back here. If they can't come back in here, well, then they're not doing a very good job of negating this move. And after seeing a lower low into this should be a low volume area. Again, if we zoom out, there's not as much volume traded here as there was like over here. You can see, especially here, it gets very gappy here. right? And so if they can't get through there, should be relatively easy work. This is all one, at least this candle is all pretty much one way trade. So if you start trading back in there as a seller, that should be easy work. You should be squeezing those buyers. If you're not squeezing those buyers, what does that let you know? That lets you know that there's significant demand still coming out of these levels. You know what I mean? So that's essentially how I would use retracement, where if I look at that move up and I say, okay, we only retraced 382% or less, then I say that's likely a bull flag. And you're saying if we can't even drop back to, to back test the resistance that we broke out of, that that there's there's high demand still present. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, that's right. All right. And um, this was, sorry. Go ahead, you. Yeah, so that was pretty much the logic behind the setup that we, the, the string report setup, which was just, uh, let's see, it was just this guy. That was it. I don't know where the long position is, but that was just, uh, nope, it's gone. Whoops. I think because, uh, hang on. So this was the trade zone because the idea is if you, could, if, if you couldn't trade through this candle, then the sellers were not strong, right? So we'd be comfortable coming in throughout all of this. And I started it very aggressively in the middle of the range because when we put it out, when we put the idea out, it was looking like this. So there was the potential that we would just very healthy consolidate or not consolidate at all and then get going. And so the zone started out pretty high, but the, you know, the average was smack dab right in the middle. So that was the logic, at least, of that um, idea. And so, so one of the ways with the swing report that, that Lamont and I and Lori and the team work together is uh, we've, we've been calling it the alley-oop recently just because it's been working well where, you know, I have a, a, a significant lean. I have high conviction in a setup and I'll say to Lamont, hey, Lamont, you know, check this name out. And I'll then essentially say, this is meeting my criteria for, you know, we're, we're in an uptrend on ARM. There's a lack of resistance nearby. All time high is nearby. We know the reward has much greater potential once we get to blue sky breakout. And then of course, you know, the broader market is strong and semiconductors are strong. NVDA is approaching all time highs, all these little pieces of the puzzle. And so then I toss the ball to Lamont and say, hey Lamont, check arm. And I don't even, you know, I don't say any levels. I don't say anything. I say, just check arm. And I know that he knows what he's doing enough to then see, okay, you know, does this meet my criteria? And, you know, essentially it's if our both of our styles align to see a good setup, that's when we know uh, we have a, a good trade to be keeping an eye on. Is that accurate, would you say? Yeah, for sure. That was really helpful, honestly. That the, 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 the alley-oops have been really great. And I just want to point out that the trade zone is also based on this prior high. Because if you zoom into that daily candle, like on the daily, count, uh, on the daily time frame, this is the key high. But on the hourly time frame, you see how there's this little bit of balance here. You know, so if we are going to come into here, this is two days where there's overlap, right? And so if you zoom into the hourly, then that's just the hourly high over here, right? So we, we were balancing up here. And is, if they're not even going to come back to here, then this little hourly change is not being negated. So I figure if they're going to stay really strong from here, then they probably won't even get that. Deep. That's, that's, that's the whole idea. So let's now move forward to the current price action. And what would you tell me in terms of volume profile analysis for our last most recent leg up? You know, I'm honestly kind of salty about this uh, <laughs> because I, I shouldn't have stopped out yesterday, right? My stop should have been here. But either way, right now, this is totally fine. This is very healthy consolidation. Like, I know that's a terrible looking candle. Sure, fine, whatever. But that's the beauty of VP. The beauty of VP is that you can, you can see retracement 
and know whether or not it's meaningful based on change, this idea of change, right? Because if it doesn't create change, then it doesn't really matter, which is, which is why, uh, you know, the intraday setups, if you recall, when we were just talking about it on this day, intraday, we were talking about this guy, right? This, this, this uh, little structure here, which was, no, 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 I'm sorry. Wait a second here. It was, uh, yeah, it was here, right? So it was this guy here where we were talking about it intraday. And the idea was, all right, well, there's not going to be any change unless they get back under here. That's exactly where they pause. And then on this way up, I made the post saying, okay, well, this is now the key structure I support. And that's pretty much where the battle has been taking place throughout all of this daily price section right now. So even though you trade under it, look at how it, it flips into resistance. It becomes a, essentially a brick wall, as you would say. And then it's a battle for it. And then today, you get really clean activity off of this. So I'm kind of kicking myself for not getting a follow-up trade either. But the idea is, on the daily perspective, uh, to answer your question, this is fine. Because the daily no change is here, 67.44. This is one, two, three, four days of balance, more or less. And this is the highs of that balance. This is a breakout. So as long as these sellers can't get back under 67.44, this is totally fine. This is the same concept of this, right? This retracement here, that doesn't come back down to this daily high. This retracement here, that's not coming back to this daily high, makes no change. For anybody that's watching, if you've got questions as we're going through this, feel free to type them into the chat room and we'll read those and answer them at the end. So I see there on the right, it says daily no change, which you just mentioned. Is this an indicator that automatically puts that level there or where, where are these lines and levels coming from? This is probably the part that most people will not like about VP. Everything I do is pretty analog. I like I, I draw the levels and like everything is manually done. I, I right click on these things and I write a label. So no, I just move these. And, and I know that's a reference for me, you know, and I know it's on every single time frame. If I zoom in and out, I care about that primarily. And so that reminds me, you know, you say daily no change. I'll see a tightening range. And I'll say nothing changes unless we break this resistance level or this support level. And then that helps me save time, essentially mental bandwidth to, to just ch check something and say, are either of these two levels breaking? No, then nothing's changing. And it seems like it's a, a similarity. So one other question that I have is, what would you say, you know, you know my style, obviously, of trading, what would be one of the bigger differences, some of the bigger differences with volume profile and your style versus what I do? I think probably the biggest shift um, is how I prioritize the price action trends, because I definitely am considerate, though. I definitely care about price action trends, but I also acknowledge, like, I contextualize the price action trends with areas of balance. Because I know that if you get like a daily lower high or lower low or a higher lower higher high and it's into a big old block, the odds of that seeing follow through are diminished. No different than like a bull flag under resistance, right? A bull flag under resistance, you're not going to have as much confidence in it as opposed to a bull flag that's over resistance and then there's like not much volume traded above there. So that's probably the biggest thing. And this is something that used to trip me up all the time. Actually, one of the first things you ever corrected me about was me extrapolating too much on a trend change. I think I said something like, okay, well, we got the hourly trend change, so that daily low should be set and whatever, we'll probably break to higher highs. And you were like, hold on, hold your horses there. <laughs> you know, that's a, that is too far, right? We The hourly trend change is set, so the daily low is likely set. And whether or not we can get to higher highs from here, is there's a whole deluge of context that would affect that, right? How much range is there to the next resistance, et cetera. So for me, the biggest piece of context then regarding the price action trends is, is it coming into a big old block? Like if you look at the ES, I'm sure we'll find plenty of examples, although, you know, I don't, I don't have anything necessarily queued up. So for example, this, right? This must have been like a weekly, right? Yeah, these were weekly lower highs and lower lows. Now, it wasn't the first lower high or lower low, but th this, you know, you may have been very worried about this, right? Like you see this lower high, lower low. Okay, that could have been the monthly time frame. That could have been the monthly time frame starting to really send it, right? If they really pushed it back into this structure. But because you know that on the that you have this big old block of volume here, Right, And this big old block of volume is pretty much sitting on top of a much bigger block of volume. You know that these sellers need to trade through this structure in order to really make a statement because otherwise the breakout, of this whole breakout has not, not been negated. You know, So I, we were looking out for this structure for months. As soon as we broke out, I had this marked up. I said, pay attention to this. There's no change. There's no significant change, bigger picture, unless sellers can get through this. And you can see how much volume was traded there. It's a huge amount of volume. 
this low being made there is not a coincidence. You know, the low being made there is because there's a bunch of demand there. You know? Yeah. And so the, the, I was just going to clarify for everybody watching the, the volume protruding that far out to the left means there's a massive amount of volume there. And it's essentially, you know, where I look at something and say, this is a price level of support. You, you almost look at that and say, this is a volume level of support. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So like you would look at it just that guy, right? Like we probably just look at this fellow over here as the last major um, higher low, right? And that would be the reference. And I just look at this whole thing over here, this whole, you know, it's, it's like a family. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, the power of blue sky breakout, obviously, is the fact that there is literally no big blocks overhead. And so let's just say now that it's relevant with so many names near blue sky breakout, uh, how would you utilize volume profile in terms of resistance? Do you have to be zoomed in on like the hourly time frame to see something building? Or how, how would you utilize that to determine, you know, it's probably a good time to take some profit into this momentum to the upside? Yeah, that's a great question. So typically what I'll do if you're dealing if you're dealing with something that's in blue sky breakout, you have to zoom in, like you said, to the smaller time frame stuff. Because on every single time frame, you're going to see this happen. You're going to see areas of balance. You're going to see mark up or balance mark down, et cetera, over and over again. So for example, if we go back to ARM, ARM is kind of doing that right now, right? If we zoom into ARM, there's probably, let's see, it's really just this guy, right? So this tiny little bit of balance over here is the only thing that's in the way. No different than if you look at the SPX right now, that's what the SPX is doing. The, SP, no, hold on a second. the SPX is testing this guy. This is a tiny little bit of supply that's sitting at all time high from December 27th to January 4th. And if you zoom out, scroll out, the value area low of this structure pretty much rejects it to the tip. And then if you'll notice what's, what's happening right now, this is the value area high of this big structure, right? So within, within this larger structure from 1019 to 119 is this little guy. So these are the two key structures we're watching right now. And right now we're just kind of ping-ponging between those two, right? Like, so what does that tell you? That tells you there's supply coming out of this guy and there's demand coming out of this guy, you know? And so when you're dealing with an all-time high uh, name, then you just are constantly assessing the tiny little uh, structures that are being left behind. So again, if we go back to ARM, I can almost guarantee you that this structure will come into play. That this, this, I can almost guarantee you that this will, there will be plays to be had off of this, right? Because this is the last little bit of balance, last little bit of supply that was left overhead. And you can see how it comes into play very soon after. Comes into play right here where you pop into the value area low, you can't find acceptance over the point of control. The point of control is where the majority of volume was traded in this structure. So if you are under the point of control of this structure, that means the majority of sellers from this structure, they must be affirmed, right? They can only be negated if you can trade above 72.82. So as long as you're trading under 72.82, the majority of sellers from this structure are, are being affirmed, they're being supported. Is, is the point of control, and I see it's, it's the, the highest volume bar there on the right side, is that always in the midway point of the structure or can it be right near the? No, not always. It can be near the bottoms, it can be near the lows. So all you have to do is check out like a session, a session VP. So here, this is a chart that has every single session's volume profile, right? And so you can see sometimes the uh, point of control is way up high like yesterday because we had a bunch of balance and then a late dump. Right. So you had a lot of volume, heavy volume selling yesterday, but because they didn't stay fixed in a range or whatnot, you didn't have a lot of volume building at a specific price. You had much more volume building up at this price. So the point of control was much higher. So it depends. Does having extended hours on or off? I know you're primarily a futures trader where you don't have to worry about that. But for stocks, does having extended hours on or off significantly shift what volume profile looks like? It will. It absolutely will. So me personally, when I trade stocks, I don't really care about the extended hours because when you look at the amount of volume traded, it's, it's pretty insignificant. I find it is cleaner for me uh, because I just I hate when you have like an hourly candle and it's like just, you know, just a dash, you know? Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't I don't like, you know, that stuff kind of throws me off for a loop. So I prefer to just deal with the regular trading hours because the regular trading hours is when everyone is playing. Big money is not playing in the after hours, or if they are playing in the after hours, they, they, they got their, their, you know, they're their pants down, you know, <laughs> and they're in some kind of emergency situation. So personally, I stick with the regular trading hours only. 
Cool. Uh, if you got another example, let's go to another swing report name, maybe GDX or something similar, just to do another quick example and run down in terms of uh, what was the basis for looking for an entry or something along those lines? Yeah, I would love to go over this concept that you talk about all the time and that comes up very often of follow through. So what you call follow through, I also call follow through, but I very often will use the word acceptance, right? And so the idea is it's not about whether or not you can achieve the goal, right? It's about whether or not you can hold on to the goal. It's like if you're in a, a war and you, you know, capture a fortification, you that doesn't mean anything if you can't hold on to the fortification, right? So that's what I consider acceptance, AKA follow through. And so for Apple was one of our swing report trades. And this also goes, you know, uh, 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 is also in line with like the predetermined zones. Like you, you know, you're very kind to say that I, I'm, I, you think I'm better at that. The idea is like that structure is going to be key as long as there's no acceptance beyond it. That's how I do that. You know, that's how I'm picking those structures. No different than uh, than ARM, right? The, the, the ARM was the same idea. Well, let's stick with Apple. So Apple, on the trade idea was presented on this day. And the logic was this. This point of control is key, 173.03. Why? Because this is the point of control of this guy over here, which was the problem for the buyers throughout all of this price action. The buyers could not overcome this structure. Right. And then when they finally do overcome this structure, you'll notice how they try to defend this point of control many times because this point of control, if it's being defended, lets us know that the majority of buyers from this structure are being affirmed. The opposite of what was happening here, what was happening here. Right. So I'm looking for the opposite now. Over here, we would be looking for a sell off of this structure. Now that we've traded above this structure, now we're looking for a buy on the back test of that structure, because if these buyers are going to be constructive and hold over these highs, this is a very good proxy to see whether or not they're gonna get back down into this big old area. So the goal for the sellers after this breakout is to drill back under this. They can't do that unless they can get flip this guy back into resistance. And so after I saw this move down to the value area low, it holds it, pops back over the POC, that's when I put out this Apple idea saying, okay, if we hold this POC back test again, we're probably gonna come back here. Now that was a stop out, but was there acceptance beyond this point of control? No, you see a lower low, beyond this low, and then you pop back over this point of control again, and that's when we put in the trade idea again. First of all, if you just move this over, right, right, and you stop out and then you just move it over after it comes back over, it's fine. You know, the, the, the trade idea is very good. But what I did was I ended up buying this one. I ended up buying this open because after seeing no acceptance, this is combining some ideas again because I'm looking for this to be the daily higher low. If this is gonna be the daily higher low after it just failed to back test this point of control, it should get going, right? Because they, they didn't get back, the sellers didn't get back to where they had to get back to. And so if that's gonna be the higher low, this open opening up over here should be a strong open, right? So I just bought that open. I throw my stop under the low and it is no risk at all, right? Like the, the open here is uh, 176.38 and the low is 176.21. So you're risking 17 cents. You know, you're risking 17 cents on this. There's no risk on, on, on a setup like this. It's incredibly asymmetrical. So although we didn't capture it here because there was no follow through, there was no acceptance, this is potentially a daily high or low. That's a very comfortable buy in the open here. And this one was a, you know, that one was a banger. We rode this up until here. Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously it kept going, but, <laughs> but I'm not gonna be upset about, you know, um, a, a trade like that. I think that was a very reasonable uh, trade. So let's now go to, uh, I'm, I'm curious, the metals, if you could pull up uh, the, the miners, GDX. I'm just curious, honestly, because I still got positions and I know that uh, these bulls still have some proving to do. Um, so I'm looking for some insight in terms of, you know, should I be looking to trim some more profit or let this keep running or, or where do we stand right now? I think you're sitting pretty, honestly, right? So this is the bigger picture GDX trade setup. And again, it's always based off of key structure. I The reason why this trade zone, the lows of this trade zone is off of this guy is because as long as they're holding this, which is what held price here and here, then I assume they should be trying to get to here, right? Where, where they're really trying to get to is all-time highs. But where they had problems last, right, after holding this structure, this guy, after holding this guy as support, they came here. 
So if they're going to keep holding this guy in support, they should keep trying to come here. So the targeting, it's going to look kind of frustrating because it's missed our target three times, two times now, by, by like a few pennies. Um, but the idea is, as long as this structure is holding, they should be trying to get here. Now you, you take that idea a little bit further and you look at all these highs, right? What, what are all of these highs made off of? This like inverse head and shoulders kind of a dealio. It's this guy. You scroll to the left and you look at this guy here and you'll see, okay, well, it's, it's been a battle for this, right? And so you'll, you'll, if you, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to pick up on these structures that were reactive in the past and then you design your trades around those. Because I know now that as long as, because look at, look at what happened here, right? This has been the launching pad as well. The first time that you price leaves this range to the upside, where do they have problems? They have problems right here. It's pretty much a value area low rejection to the tick. And then they try to come back down here to negate that and they fail. And so they move higher. And so as soon as you see that, that you should, you should realize, okay, this is a significant structure as well, which of course makes sense because this guy is a gateway into this, which is a gateway into this. That's just how it has to work, right? And so you're always, the market is always trying to find the fairest price to do business and it remembers old prices that were fair, you know, because that's just human psychology, you know? Like if you, if you know that 10 of your friends bought a Honda Civic, for twenty thousand dollars over ten years, they all they all pay that same price, and then you go into the Honda dealership and they want to charge you forty thousand dollars. You're not going to buy that car, you know, because you know what value is, right? You know something's wrong. The market's not right right now. I would just wait until the Honda Civic comes back down to a reasonable price. You, you know what I'm saying? So all of these prior areas of balance are very good um, references. And so right now, I would say that as long as we are, first of all, as long as we're holding over these highs, there's nothing to worry about. Right, because if we're holding over these highs, then we're not coming back in here. If we're not coming back in here, then this demand is being affirmed. And so as long as we're hanging out over here, where should they be trying to get to? They have to be trying to come to here. Do I know that they'll get there? No, I never know what they'll do. You know, I only know what they will try to get done. I have immense confidence in what the buyers and sellers are trying to get done based on prior references. I just don't know if they'll actually get there. And the reason why the targeting was based like a, a, a little bit shy of this, you know, of this guy is because there's a, a lot of volume traded here. There's a big chunk of volume here. So I don't imagine that they will trade right through it and get there right away. And so I figure, you know, try to get the easy target, even though it hasn't hit. <laughs> so just a bit, just a bit under that level. And to, and to tie it in, you know, I love nature analogies. Uh, the way that I'm viewing this, so so we got the purple lines as the point of control within the, what is it? What do you call the, the rectangles again? Area of balance? Oh, balance, yeah. So, balance areas. so when you got two areas of balance, I almost just imagine like, uh, you know, just, just ridges in the sand and you've got water traveling in the area in between and, you know, banging the higher ridges in the sand until it can push over one of the ridges. And uh, path of least resistance reminds me of electricity just in terms of, you know, obviously how electricity and water are both always looking for the path of least resistance. So uh, essentially what you're trying to do with the target is put it just under the next area of balance, assuming that there's going to be some issues there and wanting to exit before those issues uh, arise. That's exactly right. I have made that exact same analogy. It's literally like that. It's like water flowing through these high volume areas, right? And you're not, so if there's a high, there's a peak of ground before this water and it keeps rushing up to it and it's not enough to get over the peak, what's necessary? More water, more volume, you know? So that's that's actually exactly how I look at it. It's, it's very natural in that sense. Nice. We didn't plan that. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> if you on your screen want to pull up the the swing report and just give people a little bit of a, a better idea just in terms of uh you know what what the a trade idea looks like or things like that sure yeah so the swing report looks like this uh if you go into the actual swing report then we'll you'll have the market wins rundown which is like an overall market kind of a deal and then the trade ideas are eventually going to be somewhere down here you'll have an individual Every week, I'm going to do at least two novel trade ideas. Um, and those trade ideas will be presented like this. They will be big picture trade ideas because we're trying to cater to all kinds of audiences. So people who are want to be a bit more hands off, then you're just looking to take trades using our trade zone. I still recommend some slight adjustments, but you know I'm an active trader, so obviously very biased. I personally would still suggest if you're going to scale into the zone that you wait for like RSI to get pretty beat up on the lower time frames, and then time your uh, or time your entries accordingly with that. But 
you know, I, I stand by the, the ideas. Like even if, even like NPC is a really great example, by the way, of, of a, a predetermined zone. This trade idea was published back here and it has worked like four times already <laughs> because, because it's all based off of these key structures. It's based off of this guy. As long as buyers hold over here, they should be trying to come here, which happened one, two, three, four, five times, whatever. And this guy is the lows of the trade zone, which freaking nails it over here. Because if you notice, there's a little bit of balance here. And so I always want to give it wiggle room. And so I have to ask myself, how am I going to give it wiggle room? Because this is my main daily structure. If I'm going to give it wiggle room, I need to be on a time, time frame lower. So if you zoom into the hourly time frame, I just use this tiny, it's more than 15, I guess, a 15 minute time frame. I just use this tiny little guy as a reference, because if I zoomed out, I saw that that made these lows here. So the lows of my key structure, right, on the daily time frame were made by this little hourly guy. And so I just thought, okay, I'll make the lows of our trade zone, the lows of this little guy, which made this guy. And if you'll notice, we zoom out here and the point of control of that structure makes this light low later on. So that's how I do the predetermined zones. That's the secret sauce. You can take it, replicate it however you want. Don't even sub if you don't want to, but that's the, that's the secret sauce, you know? Um, but the swing report looks like this. We have the swing pick ideas. Every week we'll have updated ideas as well. And then on the dashboard, you will also get what I'm doing. Uh, and Dan will also post the trades that he's taking as well. And that's just that on our, the uh, quick updates over here. And uh, yeah, all of the activity as we do it, we'll post it out. Additionally, uh, if you want to filter by whoever whoever made that alert, then Charlie Man Dan is over here. Char Guys Lamont is over here. Uh, additionally, we have the oops the dashboard, which just keeps track of you know the the picks or whatnot dashboard over here. Um, and that's uh, pretty much it. You can set alerts as well, but I personally would just use the broker alerts or the charting software alerts. But we have that for you as well. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're you know not as tech savvy or whatever. Then, and you want everything in one place, then the website is going to, you know, it's going to have everything you need. Shout out to Toby. Did a great job. All right. So I've got uh, another couple of quick questions. So, so volume profile on the right side, that's number of shares traded, correct? Is there any reconciliation between dollar volume? You know, if you've got price action, that's now twice the, the share or it's twice the, the dollar amount per share. Uh, how does that factor in that does it at all? You know, that's a really good question, Dan. Yeah, I don't think it does. I don't think it does because that should all be share volume. Yeah, that's definitely something that to be considered of and that I should be considered of in the future. Fortunately for me, I trade futures, you know, so that doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't really affect things, but that's a really good point. Yeah. You know, I haven't really noticed it be problematic even when I'm looking at names like MSOs that have seen a lot of dilution. So mm -hmm. I don't know that it matters that much in that regard. And that might be like one of the self-fulfilling prophecy kind of things with TA where it's all about what people see, you know? Because if people are just seeing these peaks and valleys or whatnot, then they might not even be considerate of the dollar volume. That's really interesting. I will have to, I will have to be considerate of that when I am trading a name that has had, you know, splits or whatnot. That's, yeah. that's a good point. I'm smart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so a couple of questions. What's the, what's the exact volume profile indicator that you use? That's just in here, indicators, and you go to technicals, uh, profiles, and then fixed range profile is the ones that I draw myself manually, uh, which I, I, I personally think it's the best way to do it. And then session volume profile is the one that I showed you over here, where it's just each session is plotted. My, by the way, you know, I, I should say that the session to session profile is a huge part of my approach for it's not really for the swing trades specifically um but that is typically how i position for swing trades and it w and the idea is like if we use the apple example um on that day when i was uh when i when we bought this bought this open over here that was the sixth and the reason why is because we were way over the point of control of the prior session so that was november 6th um, let's see, November. Oh, it doesn't, it's not going to give you the uh, data anymore. Yeah, uh, too far I, back. Yeah, uh, it's too far. With regards, we got a question on this Apple trade. So you mentioned you, you're buying the open. Do you use a larger position size because your stop is so close and your risk is less? I use my whole account. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, dude, because the risk is nothing. It's usually like half a percent risk. So I will throw my entire account. It's a swing trade account, but I will throw my entire account. And I, because that's a, a total reasonable amount of risk, right? And it's so asymmetrical. So here's the volume profile on that day. Now, remember the caveat to this, you know, is that the daily context needs to be appropriate, right? Like, so on this day, remember, this is potentially a daily higher low being set. And now we have an open that is above the point of control. And so I know if they don't come down and crack that point of control, the sellers prove nothing. So if we move down to here and we only get to the value area high, and then we turn around and get over the open, I will buy that open knowing that the risk is nothing, 0.14% risk. Who cares? You know, you can, you can fire away with that much risk, no problem. And you're even just to get to the prior high, right? Just to get to the prior high. So let's say you have a sloppy, because you're going to get slippage, right? I, I almost never get a perfect fill, right? But so you're going to get slippage. So something like that, even just getting to here is a 1.9 R multiple. That's just getting to the high of yesterday, you know? <laughs> you know? And then you take your, your however much you want off, right? To get risk-free and then you let the rest ride. The GDX is a really good example of that as well, right? Because for GDX, when we bought it on this day, right? When you buy this open, it's even easier because it's a gap. Right. And so, you know, if they don't fill the gap, then the sellers prove nothing. So if you get incomplete gap fill, that's over all these resistances. And then you pass back over the open, you, you can definitely buy that open. And if it rolls back, okay, fine. You take your half a percent loss or whatever. Fine. That's trading, you know? <laughs> you know? So that's a good example of a difference. I personally uh, struggle to buy gap up opens to long them. And that is due to my experience trading euphoria markets. And you've heard me say a million times, gap ups are for selling as obviously a generalization. Uh, but I know that for me, I need, you know, if, if we gap up, I personally will need an hourly higher low, a little bit of a pullback to give me a support level. Whereas, you know, something like GDX, we open and then we run. And that's something that I know that I would personally uh, struggle to long right at the open there. That's my favorite play, honestly, you know, like it's uh, because it, it, you either you either are wrong and then you're wrong very fast, which is the best way to be wrong, right? Fail fast, fail forward, <laughs> you know? And so you're either wrong right away or you're proven correct very quickly and very correct. And then it becomes very easy to manage the trade after. So you're pretty much front loading all the stress, you know, you <laughs> front load all the stress into that first move. And then if it works great and if it doesn't, fine, you take your take your loss, you know, it's fine. And, and don't get me wrong there will be slippage. So what you think will be like a quarter percent might actually be a half percent. But if for me personally, if I'm dealing with anything under 1% of risk, I think that's totally fine. Because again, when it does work, it's so asymmetrical. Like the GDX trade, this was what, like a 4% day or something like that? I forget. Yeah, was big, that was a real big day. Yeah. Uh, one more quick one, and then we'll answer any straggler questions we got here. Uh, go to MARA, please. This one is, I've been day trading this like a madman. Uh, where is the next resistant zone as we are, you know, we cleared that, that 19 zone and we're in the clear a bit, but what are we looking at? So I would be looking at it as this, as one structure. And then for more detail, I'd be looking at it as this guy. So if we mark this up right now, it would be this fella here. So stop right there. So what did you just do with that, that diagonal? Let's just assume someone wants to practice drawing their own areas of control. Ah, okay. So this part, basically, you want to see where the market has done. Well, let me. I don't. I don't want to delete that. <laughs> but the market. You want to see where the market has had two-way trade, where the market has pretty much said, "Okay, we think this is pretty fair business, fair price to do business," which means that it was range bound. Oh, you might call it a Darvis box. You might call it a rectangle. You might call it sideways trends. You Scales might call balancing. it balancing. Or there you go, order <laughs> block, seesawing, whatever, <laughs> right? Whatever you want to call it. But as long as there is two-way trade. That's where you want to be drawing these fixed range profiles. And it's all fractals, right? Which is why, like I said, we're going to, we'll pay attention to this guy as well. But this guy is probably the most important one because I think, yeah, it probably made those highs over there, right? So if we finish drawing this up, then the value area low, I think, well, actually it fails there just should, came just shy of it. But this should be the area of supply that is problematic for these buyers and they failed to come up to test it a few times. And so now, now that you've traded through the point of control here, they should be trying to come here, 
if they're going to have a problem getting to 27.9, mind you, you know, we've done, I've done, clearly I've done some analysis for members, you know, on this chart. I haven't traded it, but of course there's been some analysis. So, you know, these, these, these structures have come into play, particularly this one. This was a trade. I remember this setting up for, I don't remember his username anymore, but I remember setting this up on a stream. I bet you if you go back to Thursday, April 13th, I talk about setting this up. And so, and so it shakes out over here. But that's what I'd be looking out for. This guy next, 27.98. I got stopped out there, I remember. I go, go back to that, that zone there. Um, yeah. trying, so I, I loved the tightening range. I loved the building of support. I, I loved the lack of resistance if we clear that uh, upper $12 level. I'm trying to, to remember which candle stopped me out. I assume it was that, that little gap down open, that quick flush, and then that turnaround. Um, and that is, or you know what it could have been right after that? You, you set the daily higher low. So here's an example of our different styles. So after that big candle I just mentioned, we pull back, we set the daily higher low, then a little lower high. I'm looking at like June 12th, 13th or so. So over to your right a little bit, or a little more. So yeah, so we set a little, no, back up. A little couple more, yeah, right in there. So we set a little higher low, then a little lower high. We break support and then just all bulls there. And I'm wondering if that is where it triggered. And your mindset is if if we're not getting down below the top of that balance zone at 880, whatever, then it doesn't matter that we broke that short term daily higher low. Exactly. That's exactly it. That's probably the key difference between how I look at it. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm going to answer some questions here. Let's see what we got. So answer the indicator. Do you know what the difference between NPOC and POC is? NPOC? Yeah. It's Probably small... naked point of control. A naked or a virgin point of control is a point of control that's never been tested. Let's keep I... it PG-13. Okay. All right. <laughs> Somewhat clothed point of control. <laughs> Let's go with point of control. I, I I imagine that's what they mean. I have never come across the term NPOC, no. All right. Uh, how do you decide which structures are key on the daily chart? So again, if, if someone wants to get like practice drawing their own structures, how would you suggest they do it? Um, so I would just suggest looking at it just like, first of all, if you, if you just want to get started and let the tool do its thing, you just use session to session. Right, because with the session to session chart, you'll get a feel for 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 uh, how price responds to these to these uh, structures. Because each day, each day is essentially the market agreeing on more or less fair price to do business. Right. So, for example, you see all of this balance on the daily, and then you break out. As soon as you see the breakout, that lets you know that value is trying to move higher. Right. Price is trying to go higher. And so, whenever then your then your reference always becomes the prior day. If this daily trend is going to continue, the prior day's point of control should not be violated. So here is the breakout. Here's the like the a bunch of daily range. So let me just mark up, let me just mark up this resistance level here. Do right. you care about candle closes with regards to? Nah, okay. it's not a matter of close, right? Because a close is just a time regulation, right? Time regulates everything. It's arbitrary. You know, like you can get a close above, close under, close above, close under. That can happen, you know? So the close is just a matter of an hour or a minute or a 15 minute ending. That to me, that means very little. It's just like the fortification analogy again, right? Do you do you give the general credit for holding on to the fortification for 30 minutes? You know? <laughs> no. No, you give him credit for holding on to it. Period. <laughs> you know? So that's the way that I see it. I, I think this is, you know, a, a fine way of looking at it. I like that analogy a lot for in terms of acceptance, people seem to understand, seem, seem to take well to that one. So once you break out of this daily range, you know each day's volume profile is going to be your reference. So for example, you know the daily's in breakout mode as long as we're over 459.65, we're breaking out of that balance. And here is an open where you're under the point of control, right? So that's not good. But then when you trade over it, you'll notice that the buyers defend this POC and then they move higher. Right. And so you're, you can just use it from session to session plays as well, which is pretty much what I do every single day in the futures room. It, this is what I'm doing. I'm looking at the daily context and then I'm looking at yesterday's volume profile and then I'm deciding what I'm going to do on the open pretty much based on that. I'm pretty much always going to trade with the direction that value is going unless the prior day's point of control is violated. As long as that is not the case, I'm going with volume, with value. And even if we're opening under the POC, I'm still probably going to try a buy first 
because I want to see can they get back over it because value is moving higher, you know? So I'm not going to, I'm not going to say the, I'm not going to count them out yet until we really cannot get back over the point of control. So if you just want to use, you know, like uh, just let the tool do its thing for you, session to session is totally fine. But if you are going to practice drawing um, fixed range profiles, I suggest using the indexes because you, they're going to have less erratic moves. Like, don't get me wrong, you can go to something like AI, something very volatile, and it's going to it's gonna be very helpful still, um, right? Because, for example, even right now, this guy is the key structure, and you can see how... And you can see how all of this price action has been dictated by this point of control, right? Like, you cannot tell me that that's not the point of control being reactive. You cannot tell me that that's not sellers reacting off of that POC. They are defending that POC, absolutely. And then when you, come, you get over the POC, where do they have problems? The value area high. This has been marked up for a long time, right? And you can see here, value area high hold, value area high hold. It's a battle, right? Between this supply zone and this demand zone. All of this price action has been dictated by this supply and this demand. So I would, personally, I would suggest you do something like the, the SPY or the SPX, where you get very, very clear areas of balance, right? Because it's the most liquid instrument, you know? So you're, you're more likely to find areas of consistent balance in uh, the, 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 the very liquid names. Uh, question, do you notify swing trade members of your trade live? How does that go out? Yeah, we do. So those are the alerts here. The alerts can get pushed to your email or they, or you can come to the swing pick dashboard. So if you come to the dashboard, uh, all of the alerts get pushed to updates uh, here. I will always do my best to try to send out an alert. If I'm going to do an open play, most of my trades are off the open. So if I'm going to do that, I do my best to give you an alert in the pre -market. Right. I'm going to let you know, hey, listen, this is positioned well for it now. And, you know, you if you just watch what I do, just like the futures game, if you watch what I do just for like a few times, I think I think it becomes pretty clear. I only have a few tricks, you know, <laughs> so I, I'm not a multi trick pony, just a single for the most part, single trick kind of guy. I'm, I'm always almost always going to make decision on the open. And the, the a huge part of the open trade is the context, the daily context. So the, the benefit of that is. If that daily context is appropriate, I'm going to know in the pre-market. So I can always give you some heads up in the pre-market. Now, again, if you're a less active trader, no worries. You know, you just use the, the big old macro trade zone. I stand by those levels. You know, I don't trade like that anymore because I would rather throw my entire account at something. Because even if I, even if I fail at throwing my entire account at this very asymmetrical trade, even if it's a failed trade, I can probably get away with something. You know, <laughs> right? Because if you if you take that quick chop like a percent away when you're only ever risking like 0.25 percent, that's already good enough. So different strokes, different folks. And for a long time, I did it using bigger trades on. That's how I came up. You know, was was using the golden burrito setup, which you may know if you're a Shark Guy subscriber. <laughs> Another question: Does it work well for crypto? Yeah, yeah, it does. Shout out to Storm. Sure. Storm is out there using it. I know. I don't know how his play ended up shaking out, but he nailed this. He freaking nailed this one, the first one. I don't know if the, the second shakeout caught him. I'm not sure. But he nailed this first one. He, he saw this as the key structure, and he saw this move down into it. He bought the pass back over, threw his stop under here, took his 1R chop, and that was it. And you look at how meaningful this structure is, right? It comes into play throughout all of this daily range. So, yeah. Because the idea is this, right? Like, this is the market. This is how the market behaves. What you're looking at is how supply and demand actually plays out. You know, like, it's not, it's not, it's not derivative of anything else. This is literally how markets have to work, right? Because if there is supply, then you have to eat, absorb buyers, have to absorb that supply in, until prices can get marked up. If there is demand, sellers have to absorb that demand before prices can get marked down. That's how it has to work. And so, you know, I, I have very high conviction of this. It's called auction theory. You know, it's 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 not. I'm, I didn't make this up. You know, like <laughs> this is this is. Uh, I'm standing off the shoulders of giants like Dan, like Mr. Dalton. All of these concepts. You know, I, I'm not pulling it out of thin air. You know, I'm just kind of remixing them. <laughs> um, by point of control from the previous day, do you mean range bound? I would assume that range bound is what establishes uh, your your balance area, and then the point of control is the area with the highest volume within that balance area. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so that is what you're what you're saying is true. A balance area is an area of supply of demand. The point of control is where the most volume is traded. But when you're looking at a session to session, unfortunately, the session might not have balance, but it's still going to show you the volume profile for that session, regardless of whether or not it was balanced. So it's you you look at it a little bit differently. It's slightly different, but it's just as valuable, if not more so. Is there a Slack channel for the swing report? We had one in the past, but at this point we are sending out the updates via, as Lamont said, via email and right on the dashboard on the website. Uh, approximately how many trade ideas per month with the swing report? So it's two new ones every week. So roughly eight uh, per, per month. Uh, however many I trade, probably like two to four, I would say estimate i don't know but i'll hit the same idea many times using the open play very often yeah uh, as far as a discount we've got the 50 percent discount running so that is the discount for the moment with the string report uh do you have any tips on how to use this strategy with options where timing is a big factor yeah you know i have put a lot of thought about uh, a lot of thought about that actually so the way the way that I think that I would want to use options is with broken wing butterflies, right? Because if you are approaching an area, so like, let's just use spy or whatever. And so basically the idea is if you sell, if you are buying a vertical that's more narrow, then you can get a credit if you are selling a vertical that is wider, right? And so you can, the, the 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 problem then of course is if you know if it blows out the 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 the, uh, the uh, wide strike which it doesn't really matter that much but the idea is you can get paid three ways in this in this manner right because and this is now I haven't traded options in a long time so it's something that I've only been toying with and that's my let me just keep it simple how about that so <laughs> the way that I would do it if you want to trade it would is would be with verticals and so the way that I would I think the best way that you would do it then is when you are back testing a prior area, like let's say, let's go to uh, the Apple trade, right? So when you have Apple here and then you get this big old move above, I think when you see this move and you don't get a, any follow through onto this, I think it's very reasonable to buy a vertical here and you can buy the vertical a little bit out of the money so that it can be cheaper and you're selling this strike because the idea is that they're not coming back here. If they're not gonna come back down here, then they should try to come here to 182, right? So you can very easily buy slightly out the money because another part of your thesis is that they're gonna hold above the value area high. So if you're making the decision on the open or close to the open, then you can buy a 177, 182, and that should be, you know, it's only five Y, it should, you know, it should be pretty reasonable. I think that's a very reasonable play here, right? Because the, the odds of you getting there are pretty good. Like basically you want to design the vertical strikes. You want to set the strikes based on the VP levels and where they should try to get to next if that VP level holds. That is over my head, <laughs> just in the sense of as soon as, as soon as you start talking about option strategy, I just zone out. That's just <laughs> me personally. All right, we got one more question. Does the indicator tell you value areas on the session profile or the range profile? Uh, yes, yes, they will. So you just go ahead and, oops. Uh, let's see, yes. So the volume, the value area is just this blue, this blue area here. So everything that's, I don't know why I pointed with my hand. This, <laughs> this blue area here is the value area. So, and then it's marked by these blue lines. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Was that the question? Yeah, I think so. All right, let's wrap it up. I appreciate, I honestly, I learned some things. So I appreciate your time answering my questions, comparing our different styles and letting us know a little bit more about the swing report. Uh, again, this 50% sale will run for another week or so, probably into the new year or into the end of the year. And again, suggest giving it a try and seeing if you can make it pay for itself. That's the goal. I let's pull up the offer page if you can see that in Slack Lamont. Oh, uh, it's the offer page in Slack. Uh, in in the thread we got going, Brab just posted the uh, the link. Either way, no big deal. People people uh, got the link. 
Ah, uh, that's it. We're done. It's <laughs> I've, I've slowly been. You can see the sun slowly setting, and now I'm I'm in late night mode. You look like a villain right now, <laughs> like a Bond villain. <laughs> I did not plan my lighting. We know that much. All right. Uh, thanks again, Lamont Volume Profile. Uh, and Lamont is, of course, very active in the Slack chat room, answering all the questions, hanging out in the futures chart. So if you have interest, uh, and obviously doing live streams as well, that is the place to ask him more questions if you are within the Chart Guys community. Uh, thanks again, Lamont, for your time. And we will see you all soon. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Dad. Yeah.